adaptations to the physical environment. The key concepts for this chapter include how do environmental factors limit growth and survival? What adaptations avoid harsh conditions? How do physiological adaptations alter the organism's tolerance limits? The first question, how do environmental factors limit growth and survival? The best way to approach this is to think about the physical environment as providing both the necessary requirements for organisms, but also presenting challenges. For instance, the physical resources, the organic materials needed by the organisms, the energy sources needed by the, the organisms, all provided by the physical environment. At the same time, the physical environment will provide abiotic factors that influence the growth and survival of an organism, such as temperature, pH, photo period, um, moisture, or humidity. These together will determine an organism's survival and reproduction. As a result of the interaction with the environment, organisms have what we refer to as a tolerance zone or a zone of tolerance. These will be defined by upper and lower limits to the factors, the physical factors that an organism can tolerate. Beyond this zone of tolerance are what is referred to as a zone of intolerance, and this would be related to the organism's compromised fitness. Look at the graph for a moment. We see on the x-axis some physical factor. It could be temperature, moisture, whatever. On the y-axis, the number of individuals that survive at that particular state of that particular physical factor. You find there's an optimal condition, an optimal temperature. That's going to be in the middle where most of the organisms are optimally designed or optimally evolved and adapted to survive. If you move in either direction away from that middle or that optimal condition, you see the tolerance is still there. That is, they can still tolerate the, the habitat, but it becomes increasingly more difficult whether you move to the left or to the right, it becomes more difficult to adapt and tolerate uh, that particular environment. Eventually, you reach a point of no tolerance or intolerance. Now, this zone of tolerance is really associated with the organism's ability or inability to maintain homeostasis. And you all remember that homeostasis is the ability of an organism to maintain physiological systems within certain limits across a wide range of external conditions. For homeostasis to take place, the organism has systems like the respiratory system, like the urinary system, like the skin, um, digestive systems, the circulatory system, which help maintain the internal environment more or less independent of the external environment. Now, don't get me wrong. The external environment certainly is going to affect the ability of an organism to maintain internal homeostasis. Tolerance ranges, or tolerance curves, represent an entire population. That is, this is all the individuals in a particular area. It's made up of many individuals, and the tolerance curves or tolerance ranges for each individual may vary, and some of this variation may in fact be genetically or determined or at least inheritable in some sense. We know that environments don't remain constant. So if the environment changes, some organisms, some individuals, may be better adapted to tolerate the new range of conditions than others. And if these changes are in fact inheritable, they will be selected for. This is evolution. In fact, this would be referred to as directional selection. And in this case, this bell-shaped curve would move to the left or to the right, depending on the physical characteristic and how that had changed in the environment. But you can see now that tolerance curves, tolerance ranges, are influenced by the environment and will change and adapt based upon selective forces within that population. Now, changes in the environment uh, come in basically two forms. There are those that are um, basically predictable and cyclic, 
such as change in seasons, change on a diurnal or daily basis, tidal patterns, which in fact can change twice a day, uh, but the regular patterns of up and down, regular patterns of in and out, however you want to look at it, but represented here by a blue line, which is more or less regular and predictable. Other environmental factors will change unpredictably and erratically, as the dotted orange line shows here. What we find here is that this temporal variation in the physical environment poses a significant challenge to the organism's fitness and ability to survive and reproduce. It's going to be much easier and simpler for an organism to adapt to a constant environment than a variable one, and we could even say it's more likely that the organism will be able to adapt to a predictably variable environment than to a totally unpredictable environment. So again, the way the environment changes will, will influence the challenge of the environment to the organism. Because we are talking about the idea of organisms having to meet challenges with the within the environment, we find that organisms adapt or change, uh, and this adaptation or change to one uh, environmental challenge may preclude or reduce adaptations to others. This is actually a theory that was first uh, espoused by uh, S Simon Levins back in 1968, uh, a, a famous ecologist. And here what we're talking about is basically that adaptation is a cost benefit, that is a risk benefit or trade-off. And so taking care of one environmental challenge might influence how you can, uh, as an organism, respond to other environmental challenges. What adaptations uh, does an, do an organism, excuse me, what changes do an organism does an organism have to respond to harsh conditions? Well, we'll look at this in sort of two ways. One is to adapt, as we were talking about. That is, traits that match the organism's tolerance limits to the physical conditions that it faces. This would be selection, natural selection, uh, evolution over time, changes in behavior, in form, morphology, change in physiology or biochemistry. Then another way to uh, approach this would be avoidance, to sort of get out of the way of bad conditions. This might be accomplished by migration, by movement, that is behavioral avoidance, or by metabolic avoidance, where you change physiology or metabolic um, rates, and we'll talk about hibernation and estivation in particular, uh, to escape or avoid harsh or bad conditions. Let's talk a little bit about these uh, avoidance adaptations. Pr start with the metabolic avoidance. For instance, seeds have dormancy, that is a period of quiet in which they can spend time avoiding unpredictable habitats. The dormancy can be indeterminate, that is it can last for a long period of time. In case of seeds, sometimes it can be decades or even hundreds of years that they will survive in the soil and then germinate when conditions are appropriate. The other metabolic avoidance that we might see, particularly in animals, is a condition referred to as torpor. Torpor is a physiological condition in which metabolic rates, uh, temperature, heart rate, kidney function, digestion, respiration are all depressed, decreased. Um, generally speaking, torpor is an energy saving and a um, avoid both an energy saving and an avoidance behavior, metabolic uh, behavior that we see in organisms. Torpor is usually, but not always, in response to cold or food deficiency. For instance, in hummingbirds, it can occur, uh, as it does in hummingbirds, on an almost daily basis um, in which the organism will shut down to save energy. Uh, prolonged torpor is often referred to as either hibernation or estivation. Hibernation occurs in animals such as groundhogs and northern ground squirrels. Estivation, which is a sort of an extended torpor due to, um, or really to avoid drought and heat conditions, occurs, for instance, in desert animals, such as desert ground squirrels. The idea here is to slow down the biological clock, to slow down the metabolism, to avoid that harsh condition, be it cold temperature, food, depreci food deficiency, or heat and drought. 
when we look at metabolic avoidance, uh, we see that as far as hibernators, which remember, these are the extended torpor, uh, often cold, uh, that is usually occurs in the winter, um, <clears throat> going to be animals such as groundhogs and northern ground squirrels, chipmunks, those sorts of animals. There are two types of hibernators, obligate hibernators, which are like those that I just mentioned, and you see a little picture of ground squirrels there. Uh, these must en enter hibernation each year. They accumulate significant amount of fat reserves. That is, they prepare for hibernation. They'll even often find what's called a uh, 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 hibernaculum, which is a place to hibernate, a burrow or some kind of den. Um, the metabolic rates drop dramatically, as does body temperature. Heart rate slows down, respiration slows down, and kidney function either diminishes dramatically or even stops. The digestive system is quiet. Um, these are true hibernators that um, we, we that sort of characterize the concept of what we think of when we think of hibernation. On the other hand, we can have what are referred to as facultative hibernators. These enter a quick torpor state and then are aroused very quickly by external stimuli, that is by noises or sounds or changes in temperature. They again drop their metabolic rate, but the, the drop in rate of their metabolic uh, uh, of the metabolic rate and body temperature is not as deep as in obligate hi hibernators, so they don't save as much energy. Typically, we find this occurs in animals that would have difficulty coming out the other side of hibernation. Um, for instance, black bears. Um, bears really enter more of a deep sleep, not a hibernation. They can be easily aroused and do wake up frequently and move around. Um, Again, they do save energy. They do avoid harsh conditions, but it's not the more dramatic change that occurs with obligate hibernators. What are the cost and benefits of hibernation? Well, the benefits, I think I've said several times, you avoid harsh environmental conditions, you can save significant amounts of energy, and you can avoid pre predators at certain times as well. The costs, there's considerable energy for revival, and that's often the problem. You could actually, and many organisms that hibernate do, if they miscalculate, they will die, and that is, they'll cease to wake up, and that, of course, is a big risk. There's a high risk of mortality from freezing to death uh, if you don't choose your hibernaculum correctly. That is, you're not hibernating in the right place. There's a risk of predation. There's a risk of flooding and drowning. So there are lots of risks involved in, in hibernation. And I want you to often think about that as we go through the semester. That is, there are both costs and benefits that we need to talk about when we look at various behaviors and adaptations uh, in organisms. Another avoidance adaptation on the sort of large scale is migration, where we have seasonal movements from one region to another and back. These cyclic movements are advantageous because they allow organisms to move to favorable grazing areas or reproductive areas or calving areas uh, for producing young, that sort of thing. They're advantageous when the cha challenges or changes are seasonal and predictable. Uh, and often there'll be external uh, cues or stimuli, such as change in day length or temperature or something like that, which will help uh, trigger the event. And this, gra this figure is a, uh, uh, a graphic showing the migration of pronghorn sheep, where they move from summer range, up the orange, up in the uh, left-hand corner, to the winter range, the green area down at the bottom of the, of the figure. And they move back and forth in order to avoid harsh conditions and to find more favorable conditions. Now, what are the costs and benefits? Again, I want to use that theme, cost and benefits of migration. Well, the benefits, you avoid harsh environmental conditions, you expand your resource base by finding new food, by finding areas for breeding and overwintering. The costs, well, there's a lot of energy because you're transporting, you're moving from one place to another. So that's a lot of energy involved in that. Um, there's a high risk of mortality in that as you move, you might get lost, you could get hurt on the way, uh, predation could occur during the migration, and 
you're also not sure that the endpoint is still there. Remember, you haven't visited the overwintering grounds with the, with the pronghorn sheep. You haven't visited those for an entire year. Are they still there when you come back the following year? So there's lots of risks uh, involved in migration. Uh, another possibility here are the avoidance adaptations on small scale. These are sort of microclimate changes. For instance, basking behavior in lizards. You crawl out on top the rock, warm yourself in the rays of the sun. It gets too warm, you crawl under the rock to cool down. That's uh, basking behavior, so you're moving back and forth. You can modify your posture by uh, orienting towards the sun, away from the sun, by pressing your body against the substrate to either Either cool off or warm up. Uh, I see that in, in our family dog. When she comes in from in the summer and she's overheated, she likes to lie on the kitchen floor because we have ceramic tile and it's cool and she'll press her, her, her belly and underside against the floor to sort of help cool down. That's behavioral thermal regulation. Another possibility is burrowing or shifting your behaviors to nights. These are all small scale, uh, but still important behavioral avoidance mechanisms. So how do these physiological adaptations uh, alter an organism's tolerance limits? Well, first of all, we have to keep in mind that the species tolerance limit is determined by its biochemical, physiological, morphological characteristics. That is, it can only change and adapt so much if the, if the environment moves way uh, out of the tolerance limit for an organism, it's not going to be able to survive. Environmental changes may cause detrimental impacts on the organism's internal conditions if they exceed the limits, so much so that the organism is not able to survive. Um, and we see that if, if, for instance, in the case of humans changing environments by, by uh, cutting down forests or by flooding areas or so forth, changes that occur over a matter of hours, weeks, or months too quickly and too dramatically for the organisms that were there so they can't survive. There's two possibilities for uh, physiological adaptations then. You can tolerate a wide range of internal conditions, sort of go with the flow, if you will, or develop mechanisms to counteract the external challenge so that internal homeostasis is ma maintained. This is often very en energetically costly, but we'll talk about that. Uh, two ways in which this comes about are two, uh, well, maybe what I should say is two uh, physical characteristics that are very important in this respect would be temperature, because it directly affects the rates of all physiological and biological reactions, uh, or it can even change the conformation of biological molecules, and water, because it's the universal solvent and is required both at the cellular or an organismic level for, for life itself. Uh, if we think about temperature, for instance, we know that there's this Q10 concept where the magnitude of the temperature can affect, uh, can, can in fact affect uh, the, the rate of a chemical reaction. In other words, Q10 states that the increase in the reaction for each 10 degrees Celsius increase in temperature is a dramatic uh, increase in the rate of a chemical reaction. So as you heat up a reaction, you cause that reaction to go faster, if we could put it that way. Now, what adaptations, therefore, do we find with respect to organisms? Uh, for instance, well, the high temperature, we see that there'll be denaturation of proteins and DNA. So they will adapt or, adopt or be selected to produce heat shock proteins, uh, more heat stable proteins, increase the cytosine guanine content of DNA, all of which will stabilize these molecules in higher temperatures. In lower temperatures, uh, freezing of intracellular water and forming of ice crystals, uh, the way to combat that is to produce chiro chiroprotectants such as sugars and amino acids, uh, these and, and alcohols, which will prevent the formation of ice crystals in the tissues and therefore allow for cooling of the tissues, or producing glycoprotein antifreeze, which, which will keep the blood and tissue fluids from freezing. The physical mechanisms of heat transfer determine 
temperature adaptations. That is, heat from physics, we know that heat can be gained or lost by conduction, radiation, convection, evaporation, and metabolism. I'm not going to talk about each of these, but I want you to understand, therefore, the morphological, physiological, or behavioral adaptations to thermal stress are limited by these by these characteristics. And here's a little equation. You see the total heat of a body is equal to the heat that's either produced or lost due to metabolic production, uh, conductive heat, convective heat, radiative heat, and evaporative losses. You sum, you add or subtract those, and that's a summary of the heat load for an organism, and it's based upon these physical properties of heat transfer that I just mentioned. When we think of body regulation as temperature regulation in organisms, there's two broad categories. It's sometimes hard to put everything into two neat categories, but here we can talk about homeothermy and peculiothermy. Homeotherms maintain a body temperature uh, that is homeostasis with regard to temperature somewhere between 36 and 41 degrees Celsius. Endothermy, on the other hand, uh, is a sort of subset of that in which this maintenance occurs by metabolic means, by using cellular respiration. So the idea here is there are some homeotherms that are not necessarily endothermic. Uh, I will talk about that a little bit in class. But here, for here, I want you to understand that homeotherms are the broad category that maintain homeostatic uh, body temperature. Peculiotherms, uh, in, in peculiotherms, the other group of organisms, body temperature conforms more or less to external temperature. They're active under a narrow range of temperatures, and we find that there's a subset of those referred to as ectotherms, which actually try to regulate body temperature by using external sources, by crawling out on the warm rock by going underneath into the cool den. That helps them regulate body temperature, such as lizards and snakes. If we look at homeotherms, we notice that homeotherms maintain a constant uh, basal metabolic rate uh, within some thermal neutral zone. That is, within some range of external temperature, they will not alter metabolic rate uh, <clears throat> to, or let's put it this way, do not need to, to alter metabolic rate in order to maintain body temperature. When you get outside that thermal neutral zone, then thermal regulatory mechanisms must be used. Uh, shivering, uh, non-shivering, thermogenesis from brown fat, sweating, panting, um, though increased metabolism of various uh, uh, of other various means to either increase or decrease body temperature in order to maintain homeostasis. Um, here's some examples here. Now keep in mind what what we need to keep in mind here is that these are homeothermic animals, endothermic in fact, and uh, meaning they'll they'll be using cellular respiration to maintain body temperature or body homeostasis. But remember, they're going to use a variety of mechanisms. Brown fat is a special kind of fat uh, found in, in many mammals that is uh, used simply to be burned. That is, it's metabolized to release heat. Human babies have a great deal of brown fat when they're infants, when they're first born. Um, Bats and other animals have, have brown fat, and they use this to produce what's called non-shivering uh, therm thermogenesis, that is, to create heat simply by burning the brown fat. Other behavioral mechanisms are used, or other thermoregulatory mechanisms, I should say, are used. For instance, changing coat. Here's an Arctic fox in the winter, an Arctic fox in the summer. You see differences here which are related not only to thermal behavior, but perhaps other adaptations within the organism's life. But again, you see, we would change the coat. And you know, if you have a family dog, that it sheds at different times during the year. Other mechanisms are involved uh, in thermoregulation as well. For instance, here we have a countercurrent heat exchanger in the flipper of a seal, whales, arctic terns, arctic fox, arctic hares. All of these have these kinds of heat exchangers. And basically what it is, is this juxtaposition of the arteries leading from the body to the limb with veins leading from the limb to the body. And as you can see at the bottom of this graph, or this figure, I should say, the 
as the uh, as the blood leaves the body and goes towards the um, limb, uh, it is placed next to blood leaving the limb and going back to the body. And there's a transfer of heat uh, across here. And because the blood's moving in various directions, in one direction or the other direction, counter to one another in these arteries and veins, it's called counter current. And there's a heat exchange that takes place. What this does is gently warms the blood from those extremities uh, as it returns to the body. Another way to look at it is it's a sort of conserving the heat that the body of the animal was producing, uh, allowing it to, to maintain homeostasis with regard to temperature. Plants also have to deal with thermal uh, regulation. Um, now, we don't often think of it, and it's, it's a very different phenomena, but here we see morphological changes, leaf size and shape, how the leaves are oriented towards the sun, whether they have thick waxy surfaces, or reflective surfaces, hairs or pits, all these morphological irregularities change the airflow over the surface of the, the, the leaf and also the amount of sunlight that it absorbs, thus helping it to regulate uh, temperature. With regard to water, homeostasis, we think of animals first, uh, talk about animals first, osmoconformers and osmoregulators. Osmoconformers are those that uh, uh, basically uh, conform to the environment. That is, their internal osmotic concentrations, the amount of salts and other dissolved ions, more or less are the same as their surrounding environment. So they're, they're isotonic or uh, to, to their environment. Marine invertebrates fall into this category, for instance. Osmoregulators, on the other hand, maintain a constant internal osmotic concentration by somehow altering the, osm the flow of ions by using their kidneys or their gills or other salt glands or whatever to either excrete or absorb ions to either excrete water or absorb water in order to maintain homeostasis. Example of that are crustaceans, uh, vertebrates, uh, both both freshwater invertebrates and terrestrial invertebrates, those, those kinds of organisms. Here's a quick example of an osmo of two sort of opposing mechanisms with regard to osmoregulation. Marine fish ha are living in salty water. So they have a high solute concentration, which means that water is constantly leaving their bodies. So they have to deal with the, process, the problem of dehydration, in a sense, even though they're floating in water, they're losing water. So they have to find ways to maintain water and to, to regulate water loss. Freshwater fish, just the opposite. They're in lots and lots of fresh water, and they're constantly gaining water from their environment. So they have to find ways to maintain their ionic concentration and to reduce reduce their water concentration by pumping it back out. Okay. Another issue which you may not always think about is that when you metabolize uh, amino acids, proteins, amino acids, certain uh, even, <clears throat> even uh, nucleic acids, there's going to be amino groups, that is nitrogen waste produced. Uh, these nitrogenous wastes are first going to be uh, uh, may first show up as ammonia, but then uh, depending on the organism, uh, for instance, most aquatic animals will simply excrete uh, the nitrogenous waste as ammonia. Um, ammonia is very toxic, or at least has the potential to be highly toxic. It also requires large amounts of water to be flushed out of the body, and therefore water loss is very high in these organisms. Uh, mammals, such as, uh, and, and most amphibians, sharks, and bony fishes, will convert the amino acids uh, residue, that is the ammonia, to uh, urea, uh, urea is very low toxicity, has moderate lo water loss, so it solves the problem of losing some water uh, and allows them to get rid of that nitrogenous waste. Uh, birds, reptiles, insects, land snails, such as that, use a different strategy. Here, they release something called uric acid, which uh, convert uh, the nitrogenous waste to uric acid, which has a very low water solubility. It's, in fact, a paste-like material. It has very low toxicity, and that, uh, that permits them to really conserve water, a great deal of water, because they're going to excrete very little water 
with that nitrogenous waste. So you see ammonia would be, the, to, re to release nitrogenous waste as ammonia, you would have to be able to release large amounts of water um, and also deal with the possibility of high toxicity, um, whereas uric acid is very low water solubility and water loss, and urea is somewhat in between, so it's sort of a compromise between the two. Plants, uh, when they adapt to life on, on land, have a variety of things to deal with. They have waxy cuticles, they have uh, pits and hairs, as I mentioned before, uh, shapes of their leaves. Uh, they have to deal with uh, water loss uh, through the leaves. And if you stop and think about all the leaves that are on a tree, how much surface area that is that water could be lost over. Um, the mechanisms here, uh, as I said, to prevent desiccation are to seal off the water as much loss by using wax. And that's why you see on certain leaves are shiny or fruits are shiny. That's wax on the outer surface. Um, we, they have mechanisms to pull water up from the roots. They have uh, structural materials which allow them to remain um, uh, to withstand changes in water content that is lignin and cellulose. Uh, the problem here is is what's referred to as photosynthesis dilemma. That is plants need to be able to exchange gases, carbon dioxide and oxygen with the surrounding air in order for photosynthesis to continue. So they have tiny pits or openings referred to as stomata. And these stomata must be open to allow carbon dioxide to come in, which is a raw material for photosynthesis, and for, for oxygen to escape, uh, which is actually oxygen being a byproduct of photosynthesis. But as these tiny stomata are open, um, now, this diagram shows just one stomate. Um, there are hundreds of thousands of them on the surface of the leaf. Uh, as these stomata are open for this gas exchange, there'll be evaporative water loss. So there's a real problem, particularly uh, on dry, hot days or in dry, hot climates, uh, to deal with this dilemma of having the stomates open for gas exchange, but therefore having the problem of water loss. Um, I'm not going to talk about it here, but this actually resulted in the evolution of two different kinds of plants. Actually, depending on how you want to look at it, you can divide it into three. But the idea of what are called Calvin cycle or C3 plants versus hatch slack pathway or C4 plants, uh, which deal with this dilemma in, a, in, in various ways with regard to, again, balancing gas exchange with water loss.